Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Charlton Live, sponsored by the British Institute of Kitchen, Bedroom and Bathroom Installation. My name is Louis Mendes. Hope you guys are all well on your Thursday evening, our penultimate big match preview uh, of the season as we go up for our final home game uh, of the campaign against Shrewsbury uh, on Saturday. Joining me to look ahead to that match, uh, match plus uh, plenty, plenty more. Uh, first up, top right, a man who enjoys a pint of milk a day, Nathan Muller. Hey, dear Nath. Not bad, mate. I've just, uh, you caught me drinking the white stuff. Whilst I was trying to come on, and uh, yeah, you can <laughs> you can always uh, build up your calcium deficiency like me. So yeah, good to, be, good to be here. Good to see your two lovely faces. Look at Tom's little face down there. Yeah, look at yeah down the bottom there. A man who, well, unlike Nathan, wasn't breaking bones every uh, every Saturday during his youth. Uh, Tom Wallin, how are you doing, Tom? Yeah, I'm all right. More more of a squash man, me. So uh, yeah, yeah, no milk or whatever else he claims to have in that glass. But uh, yeah, I'm all good. I'm all good. <laughs> different drinks for different needs. So on uh, this week's big match preview, uh, as I said, we'll be looking ahead to the Shrewsbury game in the second half of the show. We're going to hear from Dan uh, from Salad Cast to uh, find out a little bit about um, Paul Hurst's side. They're still not quite safe yet, unlike us, who are flying high in 16th, of course, uh, in League One. But in the first half of the show, we've got plenty of good stuff uh, to talk about. A bit of a general discussion at the start of it. Yeah, a few things that have come up in the world of football uh, today that I think need discussing, like the uh, the scrapping of the uh, the replays from the first round in the FA Cup, which will affect uh, clubs at our level who uh, just love playing in the first round of, uh, uh, of of the FA Cup. And of course, Saturday is Upbeats Day uh, at the Valley, as uh, is tradition. Uh, we're going to be taking part in, in the Upbeats walk. My, myself, Nathan, Ben from Charlton Live are definitely doing it. I think that's all of us. Um, so we're going to hear from uh, Terry Pert from the Charlton Athletic Community Trust uh, and from Josh Greenwood, who's, who's one of the upbeats, who's going to join us and tell us uh, why the program's so important to the to the chaps who are involved and, and, and why um, we as Charlton fans always club together at the end of the season uh, to try and raise uh, money for that initiative. So really looking forward uh, to hearing from uh, those guys. I want to say good evening to everyone who's joined us uh, in the chat as well. Evening uh, to Sam, uh, who's the first one in there. All hell let loose is in there. Glenn's in there. Andrew, Paul, Ross. Uh, Ian, uh, George and uh, Aaron uh, are all in there uh, as well. Uh, we'll let loose is asking if that's why your teeth are so white, Nath. Is it all that all that um, cow juice you've been uh, you've been necking? Yeah, well, well, I haven't gone turkey. I ain't got any turkey teeth. So, um, have you no, just come back from Turkey? No, Mexico. Oh, there you but, go. But, you know, I, you know, mate, I didn't know my teeth were that white, but they're not yellow or brown or anything. But, you know, I thought they're just normal colour. But I'll take the compliment. Thank you very much. Five is in the post. <laughs> there we go. So, um, yeah, good evening to all you guys. Let us know um, how you're feeling ahead of the, the game with Shrewsbury. Anything you'd like to see between now and the end of the season in terms of team selection? It's a discussion we've had, but now we are literally two games from the end of the season. Is there anything you'd, you'd like to see change um, in, in the starting lineup? But all hell let loose, it says, Louis, can you put to bed this daft rumour that Alfie may is off to Wrexham. That's never going to happen. He spent years getting back to London, so he's not going to move uh, to Wales. So I, I can confirm the very first I've heard of that daft rumour is that a message. So uh, unless I've missed something online or something, I don't believe there's uh, uh, there's uh, in any situation where that's going to be happening. You did see on, on the video that Alfie did where he's ringing up ticket holders um, during the during the day that he's not planning on leaving anytime soon, which is always uh, a relief. But there has been some big uh, breaking news in, in the world of football today, Nathan. Uh, the scrapping of the FA Cup first round replays. Now, not always um, a benefit to us, of course. We we, we, we suffered a, a draw with Cray Valley um, at the Valley earlier on this season in the first round. That meant we had to go uh, for a second round, uh, for, a, for a replay, a first round replay um, over at Badgers earlier on in the season. But, you know, if we take away the... Slight embarrassment it caused us. I mean, that was one of the best days of the season in terms of, you know, for football in South East London, all eyes on, on Elton, obviously a massive day for Cray Valley. Um, you know, but then if I guess if you switch it, most of the time our first round games seem to be against pretty boring teams like Milton Keynes and us not having to go to Milton Keynes on a Tuesday for a replay is probably not the end of the world as far as I see it. So it's a little bit of both, but the majority of, of uh, lower league football fans have been pretty upset from what I've seen today. Yeah, you would. I think mean, obviously you can take it as when it suits your narrative, really. Like you say, if you've got an away trip to replay to MK Dons, you wishing that you don't have replays. But um, I mean, I suppose I'm lucky a little bit where where, we, where I was growing up in the Premier League and I went to a lot of Premier League grounds and it's a great day. But some fans, the younger fans, have probably haven't been to many and even smaller clubs in Cholton, they might get a dream draw or dream replay or whatnot, like Cray Valley did. 
Um, and yeah, they probably know they're not going to win, but it gives a little bit of windfall in terms of cash flow for them. And it's experiences, that I think, that you, you'd always dream of. So, you know, when we had that Man United one, I know it wasn't a replay, but they're the sort of things that you really look forward to as a fan. And I just think at the moment, the FA are, um, well, the whole of football, really, with the threat of this governance that could be coming in. It seems like they're all stepping up a little bit now, aren't they? And putting these sanctions on clubs and and whatnot. But I just think it's a bit of, you know, we'll... We'll give you some a little bit of money for grassroots, but oh, by the way, we'll take the replays off you. So, I know you're going to have some for and some against in terms of replays and fixture pile ups and stuff. But I don't think if you get a chance to get a replay against a top top side, I think you'll all of a sudden get a lot more energy in your legs if you're a player and as a fan. So, disappointed, but you know, the way the world's going at the moment, it's not really surprising. And I don't think this is the, the, the end of these sort of things that are give it a miss. Mm, yeah, I mean, Steve McKim, who is the uh, Cray Valley Paper Mills manager, uh, says absolute nonsense taking away a possible nice replay against full time clubs from non league teams. Uh, the additional £33 million given to grassroots doesn't create memories uh, for part time uh, players. Yeah, um, what's your view on it, Tommy? Are you upset that they're gone? Yeah, I don't think it makes any difference to us because we our record in the FA Cup is largely dreadful. So I don't really care from a Charlton standpoint, but uh, and obviously we're a Charlton podcast, so I don't want to get too deep into all of this. But it's just uh, another sign of the way football's going, isn't it? That five or six clubs at the very top, or certainly the Premier League as a whole, are, are dictating what happens to the pyramid of football, and they obviously bring a lot of the money in, and so they, of course, should have a say. But you'd like to think that they would then feed that down, and they would see part of the bigger picture, but. I think the ownerships that come in there now don't. They see the chance to make even more money. So it's making richer people even richer. It's the state of the country at the whole at the moment. And and as a result, the the people down towards the bottom sadly miss out. And yeah, I think replays are a small part of potentially being able to do something like that and do some good to football generally. So as I say, for us, it doesn't really make a lot of difference. But, you know, same as the players being tired those players play 38 premier league games and efl players play 46 games and then you factor in the efl trophy that league one and two have to play if you get a long way in that if you get a long way in the league cup even two or three rounds of course you're not playing at the same level that these players are in europe but pound for pound you're playing probably the similar amount of competitive games so i think the whole thing's a load of a load of rubbish really It, it puts me off the premier league more and more week by week but Luckily, we're not in any danger of touching the Premier League anytime soon anyway. So, um, yeah, for a Charlton podcast, we can just enjoy what we're doing now or try to. Hopefully we can next season at at the very least. Um, But, yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame. It's the fabric of of football. And, yeah, I just think that the decisions get made now aren't within the best interest of the game as a whole. I think they're within the best interest of of a few clubs at the top. And that's that's sad to see. The bit that does confuse me about the whole decision-making process is it does seem to have been basically the FA and, and the Premier League that came to this conclusion. It's like, well, why does it matter before round three then? Because none of those Premier League clubs play in the first or second round. So I, yeah, I was a little bit surprised about how they've come to that. I mean, all hell let loose says, can't we cancel the EFL trophy uh, in, instead? But again, I mean, that, does, that doesn't that does solve the, the apparent problem, which is... Um, which is a uh, fixture congestion for those sides in Europe, which is just such a small amount of teams. Robert says, uh, if we can't have replays, then let's kick them out of the uh, the famous BSM uh, trophy. Sam reckons that uh, uh, with discussion around the FA Cup, it should be the team who is lower who gets the choice if they want a home tie or an away tie. Yeah, maybe that's uh, one way of, of doing it. And Paul says, any initiative that deprives lower league sides of money at the behest and convenience of the big clubs should be avoided at all costs. The FA happy to roll over and let the Premier League uh, tickle uh, their nevers. Right, um, we had a tweet in uh, just now, actually, from Paul Griffiths, who says, uh, when I left the Reading game, I was convinced uh, that we were going down. What a turnaround Nathan has overseen. I think we're all starting to look forward uh, to next season. I mean, there's been a big discussion this week, obviously, Nathan, about the unbeaten run we're on and the fact that it's not it, it, it's many more draws than than wins in that, in that, in that 13-game uh, un- unbeaten run. But... I'm I'm seeing some people saying, yeah, that that's obviously not a good sign. But I was thinking it, it, it is something to build upon next season, and what happens this summer will be very, very interesting. But I, I think there's been a a bit of groundwork laid in the second half of this year. But it's obviously something we have to build upon in terms of the 
the the the members of the squad this summer i think yeah of course I've, i'm in the camp of um <clears throat> i'm going to try and take it positively i think that's um ali from the top 20 said on the podcast when he came on he sort of said you know Portsmouth have had a similar ending last year when Massinho came in um and it's about building blocks <clears throat> building foundations and building good habits and we've if I think back to Gillingham and that Christmas time, the one thing that we all kept saying is that we had a soft underbelly. We were really easy to play through and against. We were giving away sloppy goals. We still give sloppy goals away. I'm not saying we're the best defence in the world now, but we look a, a lot more harder to play against. And that's something to build upon because I think you've got to start with your defence, start with your midfield, and then you move on. Um, so it, it gives me hope for for the summer, for sure. But um in term in terms of the transfer window, I think it we've been saying it for years that you know it's it's a big it's a big rebuild in the summer, but I think it it, it must be different this time because before I, I'm under the assumption I could be wrong, but you know, Andy Andy Scott was doing most of the recruitment and maybe the other managers had some sort of say, but I would imagine the way that Nathan wants to play and how he wants to build the club and not just the first team, he's going to have a hell of a lot more of a say of who comes in, what profile a player comes in. So it, it fills me with a little bit more optimism than it has in previous windows. But at the same time, how many times have we had our fingers burnt before every summer or every January? So proof's going to be in the pudding um, and we're just going to wait and see. But I am optimistic. As I said in a WhatsApp chat the other day, I'm probably by the 5th of July going to be buzzing that we're going to win the league. And then, Maybe I'll be disappointed, but listen, that's the whole point of being a child fan and we've got to look forward to something. Otherwise, what's the point in, you know, sort of getting a season to get one notch, you know what I mean? But I'm in the optimistic camp, but yeah, ask me in December. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, uh, the the season ticket point's a good one because obviously you're looking ahead to next year now. The division's starting to take a little bit more shape. So Stockport, Mansfield and Wrexham have all secured autos from... From League Two, obviously Rotherham have, have come down, so we're, st we're starting to get a bit of a better idea of who's still going to be here. I think um, the likes of uh, obviously Carlisle are gone, Fleetwood are effectively gone, uh, unfortunately uh, for for them from from this division. So we're losing a couple of really northern away days, which are absolutely no skin off my teeth. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see the back of those two uh, trips. Um, Port Vale have got some work to do. Cheltenham possibly going to go. I mean Cambridge and Burton. I think Cambridge are probably close if not fully there like I say even Saturday's opponent Shrewsbury in the same position but they should be okay but yeah we're starting to see what this division is looking like now Tom I mean looking at it purely from a decent away day point of view um, I think Wrexham's going to be up there for a few people who might not have been there I can't remember the last time we would have played Wrexham Mansfield and Stockport we've been to in cups recently but both have potential for decent away day so it's starting to shape up quite nicely next year yeah selfishly all the three coming up are, are ones I haven't done um, so that's yeah, that's a bonus for me, provided I can get tickets to to them all. Uh, I imagine Wrexham's going to be fairly oversubscribed, as you say. Um, and I was listening to, I think it was not the top twenty, uh, one of the pods anyway, that was talking about the EFL, and they were kind of saying that they still don't think it's going to be that strong next year. And I know we've talked about this season as a wasted opportunity, and I still think it is because I think the league's been poor this year. But actually, my assumption was it's going to be a lot stronger next year. And actually, maybe that's not going to be the case. You look at the teams probably coming down, not necessarily the biggest thing in the world if if the right clubs come down. And yes, Wrexham are going to chuck a lot of money at it, of course, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee anything. And the other teams that are coming up, may, maybe not. So, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one, really. I think, um, yeah, I think uh, we have to look at it as a season that, we have to aim for promotion. We did that this year. Obviously, we failed on it, but th there's nothing to say that next year, as Nath said, with with hopefully Nathan Jones having a bit more control over recruitment and a bit more of a structure and all of that sort of stuff, then actually we've we've got half a chance. So um, yeah, that's what I'm I'm kind of hoping. A few a few good away days, but but most importantly, us getting out of this division as soon as we can. Mm, Sam saying facts and stats said it's uh, 1981 since we last played Wrexham. Wow, well, so. Uh, even before Nathan was born, I think, actually. So it was a very long time ago. Uh, All Hell Let Loose reckons uh, the last place will be between Burton uh, and uh, Cheltenham. Um, Paul uh, says, bang goes my hospitality gig with, uh, with Fleetwood going down. Yeah, he's a... Uh, I wonder, I can't imagine League 2 hospitality is up to your standards, Paul, so I imagine you won't be visiting them again. Uh, but he says, did you really have to bring up the Gillingham game, Nathan? My toes nearly got frostbite to see the sharpshooter who shall not be named score. 
Seems like such a long time ago. Well, he's scored again since then, which is, uh, which is uh, lovely news. Uh, Steve Wright is joining us. Says hello to all Charlton fans uh, everywhere from uh, the Exuma Island in the Bahamas. Um, good luck for the Shrews again. That's from Steve. Good to hear from you, Steve. Hope you're enjoying uh, the show. Well, before the game uh, against Shrewsbury uh, on Saturday, it's a very, very special day. Uh, that we have annually uh, at the Valley, uh, of course. It's uh, Upbeat's Day. So to tell us a little bit about why me and Nath and a couple of hundred others uh, are going to be strolling all the way from uh, New Eltham and the training ground to the Valley. First up, we've got Terry Pert from uh, Charlton Athletic uh, Community Trust Hightel. And we've got Josh uh, Greenwood uh, from the Charlton Athletic uh, Upbeat's. Goodness me, you're very... <laughs> he's he's uh, showing off his uh, flexibility there, Josh. Uh, good evening to the pair of you. How are you both? Good evening, Lewis. You alright? Nate, you yeah. good? Tom, evening, moving everyone. Yeah, hi, hi, Josh. How you doing? All right? It, yeah, doing good, doing good. Looking Ex. forward to um, tomorrow night's training. By the way, playing against um, Everton for the training tomorrow. Excellent stuff. Well, first of all, um, Terry, um, tell us a little bit about the, the Upbeats program and uh, why it's so important that the uh, the Trump fans come together uh, to do this fundraising uh, yeah. every year, as we always do. Yeah, so um, obviously the Upbeats uh, program has been running 16 years this year, believe it or not. It's uh, been there since the start. It's just a brilliant project. Um, and every year, obviously, we, we fundraise by by doing the nine-mile walk to keep the uh, the program going. Um, this year, again, we've got two, over 200 walkers, um, which would be, um, like you said, starting at the training ground in New Eltham, uh, finishing the Valley. Um and you know the upbeats is the only project in the community trust that isn't got specific funding for so we fundraise to keep that to keep that going um and over the years the Charlton fans um and family have been brilliant in in supporting that um and making it you know 16 years is a long while for a project to be running um and it just goes from strength to strength really um you know the more money we can raise the the more activities the more you know the more trips the, the better the project becomes Mm. And, and Josh, why don't you tell us a, a little bit then about what uh, playing with the Upbeats means to you and, and uh, being part of the Upbeats family? Well, I have been saying this quite a lot, but I think the whole thing about um, the whole thing about the Upbeats is my absolute is my absolute dream, um, really, to be playing with the Upbeats because I've been playing since when I was um, five until now I'm 20 because I recently had my birthday and I'm 20 now um, and uh, and the thing that I like playing about the upbeats is about how all of us are a great family we're all are like upbeat brothers because of the decent family that's going on in the community in the community um, looking forward to Belfast so I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that this um, year um this year scoring more goals at the valley pitch and um and this is my gym come true really <laughs> hi josh oh hi hello mate yeah you, you was mentioning and terry mentioned about all the trips that you go on what do you enjoy the most about all the trips that you manage to go on with the upbeats good question actually <laughs> um I, actually, I think my i think my good one would be uh, my top one would be going to Bavsham and Maidstone actually because I have been doing because I have been doing that um, quite a lot. Um, my dad said from his point of view that he thinks I was the top two men of the match and one of them I was um, the captain for that um, team. Um, score collective goals, our couple of assists and enjoying training with the rest of my team that's out there. Hey Josh, did you uh, did you say that you've scored a goal at the Valley? Um, yeah, I have scored a goal at the Valley before. So I scored it like um, like one time, couple of times. Um, Charles more... was playing against others and Everton, and this time playing against Everton again. So no hopefully, way. So hopefully I can score more goals and um, knock them dead, really. Good man. That's more than some of the uh, the Charlton players. What's th what's that feeling like scoring at the Valley? How does that feel? Um, actually, I think the feeling that I like scoring at the Valley. I think it's 
I think it's for me being really happy scoring at the Fanny at the home ground because all of the main Charlton players um, players football on that pitch and it reminds me of, of us and the upbeats and we are quite like them and yeah. uh, um, hopefully we can be like them and be professional and play our professional match against the other Dance and Drone teams that's going on. Have, that's you got a, have you got a celebration plan, Josh, if you score? Well, I have got a celebration plan, yes. My celebration plan, if I score the goal, will be a cartwheel. Nice. Might be the splits and there might be a struggle jump, but you, you wow. will find out when. So, yeah. well, look forward looking to forward it. to seeing that on Saturday. All hell let loose uh, says, um, did, do you enjoy meeting with the, the Charlton first team players? So have you had a chance to, to meet some of the first team players uh, along with some of the other lads? Well, I've been on, I think, on one of the days when I played against um, Everton. Yeah, Everton. When when we played against Everton, I run up to the first team players and tell them about how the art bits are doing and how they are doing and playing on the pitch. And my favourite player, obviously, would be Ryan Innes because he's a defender for Charlton. And I like him as well, so yeah. Yeah, and he's a very nice bloke as well. I know he won the, the Community Player of the Year last season as well, Ryan, when, it, when he was with the club. And just, Terry, um, it was only a few days ago that the uh, Community Trust got um, won Community Club of the Year uh, at the EFL ceremony in uh, in London. There's a lovely picture of you all tied up in your uh, your, your <laughs> finest clothes there on, on the website. I mean, tell us a little bit about what that achievement means uh, for, for you and for the rest of the Trust. Obviously, that was for your overarching work rather than just with the upbeats. Yeah, yeah. The uh, you know the work the the the, the trust do um, head and shoulders. You know, I'm not trying to blow our own trumpet, but we are head and shoulders above other clubs. Just the, just the amount of work that we get through. Um, it's so diverse in the in the stuff we deliver, and that can be you know in my strand, disability and mental health. We we work in in the mental health sector with elderly people, 60 to 90 year olds. Then on another day, we're working with short breaks with autistic children doing respite for them. So um, alongside that, we do a lot of crime reduction stuff, as you know, in Astrand. And that's just, you know, a tiny smidgen of the stuff the Trust does. You know, the health team's a massive part. Um, they all are all the football sports development. Um, so, yeah, it's a brilliant, brilliant evening. Um, and it just sort of showcases the work that we're doing in the community. Um, upbeats and disability work, you know, it's always my favourite sort of work to do. I've been doing it for 16, 17 years now. Um, and just to elude on what Josh said just then, it's just giving people opportunity, whether it's to be upbeat or other projects, just opportunity to to engage in activity. Um, social, the social aspect of the community work is massive as well. Like Josh with the upbeats, he probably wouldn't have known half of his mates now that you know before he before he joined the upbeats. It's just the social, the social aspect is so important. Um, you know, the, the sessions are great. Don't get me wrong, and the football that we teach them, but you can't get past the social aspect and the, and the friends that, and the friendships that are made that, that really make a difference in people's lives. Excellent. Well, Terry and Josh, thanks so much for, for joining us on, on Charlton Live this evening. We look forward to seeing the pair of you on, on Saturday when, when we're walking that nine mile trek to the valley. We'll see you. We'll, we'll see you in SE7. Looking forward to it. Take, yeah, that's that's and, Take care. And, yeah, gotcha. and it's just to let you guys know before I go, um, is that I am, if you don't know that I am a, a that I, I do love singing and I am passionate about music. And if you don't know, that I'm an acrobat dancer, by the way. Well, there we go. It's not just a, a one trick pony there, then, Josh. Well, we look, uh, look forward to seeing you guys uh, over the weekend. Thanks very much for your time here uh, on Charlton Live. Uh, this evening, uh, just before we, um, we we turn our attention back to Shrewsbury as well, Nathan Jones was asked to look ahead to the to the Upbeats walk today as well. Uh, this is what the Addicts boss had to say. Not a lot of fun going the season, but it's also the day of our annual Upbeats walk uh, prior to the game. Um, supporters are walking nine miles to raise uh, up to 35 grand or excess of 35k if they can to uh, to fund the Upbeats for another year. And now they're close to that target. Um, another example of why. Uh, we've got the EFL Community Club uh, of the season and uh, I must feel that everybody would pride. Well, to be fair, this club's got a fantastic tradition of having the community, the community at the forefront of, of its thinking and, and ingrained in its DNA. And it's, you know, we're very proud of that as a football club. I've, I, I knew that when I first came into the football club, you know, 
uh, 12 years ago, and, and I know that now. It's not the first award the community's won, but everyone is special because it just shows that the work that they do, the unbelievable work that we do, that, that, that the football club does, um, and led by Jason Morgan and, and, and people, are, is just fantastic, you know, and we're, we're really, really proud of that. Um, so congratulations to them. Um, long may that continue. And as I said, it's it just shows that the community is at the forefront of this football club, and that's why it's such a great club. Um, so then, to, you know, on Saturday, with the upbeat, so they walk and we wish them all the best because they do great work and they finance so much. Um, so again, it's just part of a wonderful community program that we've got here and just an extension of the wonderful amount of people that we have here. And uh, they'll be playing on the Valley pitch just before the main game uh, on Saturday. You'll allow yourself a little peek out the tunnel just to have a quick look. Well, I will, but they're not cut it up, that's all I can say. <laughs> uh, but no, we're, um, look, we will. We will. Um, it'd be it'd be good to it'd be good to see them. Uh, it'd be a nice occasion, and what we have to do is respond and and and, and try and put a performance in that the caps the day off. That's what we would like to do. Thinking about a new kitchen or bathroom? Find professional, independent local installers with free home surveys, itemised quotes and protected payments, trading standards approved contracts, and workmanship warranties. The British Institute of Kitchen, Bedroom, Bathroom Installations accredits installers to ensure they are police checked, fully insured and experienced. Take the risk out of home improvement. Visit bikbbi.org.uk Hello fellow addicts. I'm so excited to tell you all about our micropub, The River Owl House. The River Owl House is based in East Greenwich. It has six Pub of the Year awards, an ever-changing selection of amazing beer, it's owned by Charlton fans, walkable to the ground in just 20 minutes with buses that go direct to the Valley too. If your match day routine includes a drink with your friends, you must join your fellow addicts in the river. See you soon. Right, welcome back to Charlton Live. This is the big match preview. Just before the break there, we heard uh, from uh, Terry uh, from the Charlton Athletic uh, Community Trust and from Josh from the Charlton Upbeats looking ahead to uh, Saturday's Upbeats walk. Now, if you check in the uh, the little description below the video there, you'll be able to see how you can donate uh, to our Charlton Upbeats walk page. Um, we've got a couple of hundred quid on our page so far, which I ho hope to get a fair bit more than that. So if, if you guys have a chance and, and want to donate to keeping the program going, what we saw there with Josh and, and, and what that means to, to him, uh, and his friends and, and obviously their families as well, then, then, then feel free to do so. It's, it's just one of the very best things that the club does. Um, and, and from a personal point of view, I mean, I, I really love the community aspect of, of, of the um, of the Upbeats walk and getting together with fellow Charlton fans and, you know, fellow Charlton players as well. I know Mortz is going, there's a couple of former players will be down there as well, the ones that, that can still walk. And um, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get together, we'll have a good time and, and we'll celebrate what being a Charlton fan uh, is all about. Now, let's celebrate something else uh, of what being a Charlton fan is all about, and that's the fact that we get to play Shrewsbury on Saturday. Um, so uh, it's time to look ahead to the, to the home game uh, with Salop. They're not quite safe uh, yet in um, in League One, um, although they're pretty much on the verge of it, as our uh, Shrewsbury correspondent is going to uh, tell us now. So welcome uh, to Charlton Live. It's Dan from, uh, from Salop Cast. Good evening, Dan. How you doing, my friend? Evening, fellas. Yeah, I am all good. Looking forward to Saturday. Yeah, how nervous are you, or do you, do you feel the job's pretty much done now to finish about 17th in League One for the 50th year in a row? Yeah, 17th our natural habitat. I don't think we're quite <laughs> going to get there, but given where we might have been, um, I, I'll settle for anywhere that's not 21st or below. Um, big point of Bolton on Tuesday, to be honest. That's settled an awful lot of nerves. We're not quite there yet, but um, it'd have to be a pretty extraordinary set of results for us to end up on the wrong side of that relegation line. Yeah, I mean, tell, tell us about that game on, on Tuesday because Bol Bolton seems to be faltering a, a little bit, obviously, as they try and get over the, the line at the top of the table. But um, it sounded like a very good point for you guys. Yeah, it was a totally, you know, a great example of our schizophrenic season, to be honest. I mean, if you remember that Alfie May has scored only 10 fewer goals than our entire team put together over 44 games, you can see what the problem is. And it's it's putting the ball in the onion bag. We, we, we just, just have really, really struggled to score goals. So to score an early goal um, really helped. Uh, and then Jordan Shipley scored another excellent goal to make it 2-1. So we were, we were on the front foot for quite a lot of the game, which which was useful because we spent far too much time this season, you know, being reactive and and, and chasing things. So we, we, we turned up, we did okay. Yeah, it wasn't um, Brazil 1970, but it was a resilient performance. And I think 
um, Ch um uh, Bolton fans may disagree, but I think we were resilient enough to to, to merit the point. To be honest, hi right, Dan. Um, I, th I think you're safe. To be honest, I don't think you'll worry about that. But um, if you look ahead to next season, then I mean, what what would what's the sort of the consensus of sort of Shrewsbury fans? Cause I know you're sort of around that 17th mark. How are you? Will the club try and bridge that gap to try and make a push for the playoffs at some point, or is it just going to be consistently trying to stay above that dotted line to go down into League Two? Well, we're a lower League One club. That's that's where we are, and and, and most Shrewsbury Town fans are realistic enough enough to know that. Now, last season we finished twelfth, so that that was our second best finish for thirty years. So that puts in context that that how, how well we did last year. But the accounts came out about um, three weeks ago. We lost a shedload of money, and I know that loads of clubs lose money, but we're not big enough to be able to do that. Um, so the reason we came 12th is we spent far too much money, and we, we've got to cut our cloth accordingly. So I'm afraid the narrative isn't one of you know we're going to speculate to accumulate. We've got we've got a manager now who we trust, um, Paul Hurst. You might remember him. Got play playoff final. I don't, don't want to go too much. Maybe painful memories, but but yeah, you know, we got to the playoff final one year, um, and of course, no one expected it. And what Paul Hurst did is he made the most of the loan market. Um, we, we had, you know, we had Ben Godfrey, who's now Everton, Dean Anderson, who's now, uh, um, you know, who's now in, in, in the top flight as well. And, and, and so we need hers to do that again, to, to get uh, loan players who, who don't get injured all the time. We've had 10 this year and none of them have really done anything. Um, and we need to have a squad that really is together as one pushing forward with ideally some young talent. So that's not the type of stuff where we could think, right, next year, sixth. We go into it hoping for better, but I think we're realistic to, enough to know that we're unlikely to be challenging for the for the top two places anytime soon. Expanding a little bit on on Paul Hurst, Dan, what how's he how's he viewed by Shrewsbury fans? Because obviously you got that move to Ipswich off the back yeah. of that success, as you say, didn't really work out for him uh, at a couple of clubs, really Ipswich and a, and a couple of others. He's back with you now, I think, since January, isn't he? So yeah, yeah how's he viewed by the fans and? talking within the constraints that you've kind of given there around what's realistic for the club. Is he someone that people think can build a bit of a legacy with you guys? Yeah, well, he's viewed in messianic, messianic terms. He, he, the Messiah was coming back when it, when, he, when he got here, but that, that was because we were so poor beforehand. We played no football and, under Matt Taylor. Um, and we, we, we got some players who we thought were going to be able to, you know, to, to bring us to a higher level and, and they weren't performing. So to, to bring back someone who was really successful for us. And and you're right, he went to Ipswich and failed, but he did very well at Grimsby. They had two promotions under him. He's a good manager for a small club um, who, on a restricted budget. I think when going to Ipswich just didn't work for him. You know, he's, he wasn't that type of, type of manager. Whereas for us, the fan base is more or less united that he, he is the right man to, to, to craft a better squad next year. And, and I don't want to be too negative in saying we, we don't expect to be you know, right at the top. We, we do expect better and we expect to keep the ball a bit more, Tom. Yeah, you mean you, you'll see this on Saturday. I guarantee you that you will have much more of the ball than us. I mean, whether you do anything with it, it's not a matter altogether, but we, we, we want to see a bit more football. And again, our barriers, are, you know, it's not that high. Just keep the ball a bit. Try and be a bit more creative. And and I think Hurst is well set to do that. So, so fingers crossed next year will be at least a little bit better than this one's been. So if we had to pinpoint some danger men then for for, for this weekend, I mean, when, when, when we spoke earlier on in the season, I sort of was uh, not, not very complimentary about Dan Udo over the, what I've seen of him over the years. But he's, he is your top scorer and, and, and you were quite defensive of him. Like you, you did say he's got attributes. Is he still... A, a danger man. Is there anyone else that we should be we should be keeping an eye on? Well, it's been rubbish this year, Louis. I'll be honest with you. Your, your analysis won a million miles off the mark. <laughs> he is our top scorer, and he scored a good goal on Tuesday night. I have to say, but he is one of those classic players that either uh, looks like he's got something, bustles through tackles, um, will create chances, or he can't trap a medicine ball. And we've had far too much of the latter this season. So it, it'll be uh, it, it'll be the, the, the striker up front. We may play with two. We played with two against uh, Bolton, which is a bit unusual for us. Normally we play sort of 4-2-3-1 under Hurst anyway. But I think we may play with two. Tom Bloxham is another bustling centre forward. Um, neither of them uh, have scored many goals, if I'm being brutally honest. So if we're going to do anything, then it'll be through Jordan Shipley, um, former Coventry player, good left foot. Um, keep an eye out for set pieces, folks. Now, I don't know if Bolton did any prep but it looked like they didn't because twice this season they've done the Beckham Skulls thing where the ball's been fizzed out to him at the edge of the box and he smashed it on the volley in twice now once okay you know fine but we did it again on Tuesday night and and, and seriously it's great technique I mean you can't possibly do it a third time can he 
You know, we'll <laughs> see. But but Shipley's got the ability to do that. He strikes a good ball. He can ping in a cross. So if we're going to be creative, then then I suspect he's the man who you need to keep an eye on. Personally, if we're going to play well, then Carl Winchester in the middle of the park, former Sunderland player. Um, he, he he's vital because if he can help us keep the ball, then we've got more chance of doing stuff. If he can't get his foot on the ball, you'll have 70% possession. I'm glad you've mentioned set pieces because that's something once you've gone, we're going to be talking about Charlton's record from set pieces this year. The, the boys are not the top 20 have did a, a league table and we are, we're not bottom. So it could be worse, but we are, we are second bottom. So yeah, we'll, we'll discuss that. So great. You guys are good at that. Excellent. Well, we'll see some of that on Saturday. Dan, um, thanks for your time uh, this evening. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll be seeing you again next season. I think we will be. It seems likely, but maybe if you can get get one or two more points, that'll be certain. Uh, and and we'll, we'll we'll see you then. Cheers, fellas. Go well. There we go. That's Dan from Salopcast, uh, the Shrewsbury uh, number one podcast. Make sure you give them a, a, a listen if you want to see how they uh, see Saturday's game uh, as well. So, um, shall we hear from Nathan Jones first, and then we'll discuss a few of the little foibles of our of our performances this season. Uh, one of which is set pieces, which is a remarkable stat. Not not a shocking stat, but it is remarkable when you look when you see it written down. Uh, but yeah, Nathan uh, was asked to look ahead to Saturday's home game. Uh, Rich Shrewsbury, this is how he sees things ahead of the last home game of the campaign. Just to go, you, know, you mentioned previously that you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't be experimenting in terms of squad because you, you want to put the best side you can out there. Does that also extend to players who may be coming back from injury? Um, you know, we've got people with Knox, uh, you know, like Lord Jones, uh, actually made up very recently today, Watson, of course, as well. Um, even if they are back and potentially fit, is it is it someone you wouldn't risk because there's only a couple of games? Oh no, I'm going to play the best possible side I can play. I'm going, you know, that's that's what we're going to do. We have to one be very respectful to the league. I know I've been on the other end of it where. Where teams have been flippant and been casual, um, and that's that's not us, you know, and that's not my mentality. So I'll treat the game with the utmost respect, um, as I would with any other game. So we'll pick the strongest possible side that we can. Um, yeah, we are looking forward to, to next year in in terms of stuff, but but you know we we've got two games to to deal with, two games to 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 finish as strong as we possibly can, and and we want to do that, especially at the Valley. One player we know that uh, has been out for some time and, and was a fan's favourite uh, uh, and uh, everybody would be keen to know how he's going on. That's Miles Lubo. We know obviously a serious injury that's kept him out for the season. But uh, how is he progressing? Is he on, on schedule for, for coming back when we hoped? Well, he, he's progressing. That's that's the thing. I mean, there's there's no value in, in tr- trying to get him back early in terms of that because of the extent of the injury. You know, it was it was a hamstring injury and strikers were quick and piercy and powerful. They need the hamstrings. <laughs> Um, so it's it, it, it's it's frustrating for the club because he's been out. He's missed the second part of the season. I, I haven't you know I haven't been able to work with him, so that's frustrating. But there's no value in trying to rush him back in any kind of way. So so look, we'll we'll make sure that yeah he's on target, but we have to make sure that everything is right because you can't risk a young player with an injury like that and one that's very important to us. Sadly, sees our last game uh, at the Valley this season against uh, a Shrewsbury side who are um, still needing a, um, points to secure their own safety. Uh, they got a decent point away at Barnsley last uh, last game. It could be a battle, but uh, be a fantastic uh, to sign off um, uh, the home campaign. Really. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, we, we're just concentrating on us, and as I said we're very respectful. I know, you know, if if. Shoes on the other foot. I, I, I'm not, you know, we, if we, we go to Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury, and I know Hursty very well, and, you know, he would set up a team to make sure that, 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 that Shrewsbury got the best possible outcome they could, and that's that's what we're going to do, you know. Um, it'd be fantastic to finish on a win, but we have to make sure that we are ready for the game, physically, mentally, and, and, and tactically. Uh, and then, you know, we'd, we'd like to finish off with a win at the Valley, but whether it's finishing off with the Valley or whether it's the second like game before we finish we we want to win every game we have that mentality now and if we're going to build something then building something special doesn't happen bit part and happen one every two games it has to be we have to be at it every game and they have been at it you know this the performance levels have been there we've we've not looked like we're going to lose a game we've tried to be dominant in most games we've tried to be aggressive in most games we've tried to create chances which we have in every game um what we we haven't done is put that complete performance together, really, where we've been totally dominant and kept a clean sheet, and that's what we've that's what we've got trying to achieve. Well, there we go. That's Nathan Jones looking ahead to the game uh, with Shrewsbury 
uh, on Saturday, again, expressing his desire for a clean sheet. Uh, what will be interesting, actually, Nathan, now you think about it, I mean, those those post-match comments from Cambridge won't have gone unnoticed by the players, you know. We, we put them out there in, in, on, on the paper website, they were on, on the pod, they were on, on the radio, you know. There's Nathan Jones going out and saying the personnel at the back is not good enough. But these, I mean, these are the same personnel we've got to try and get as a result in the next two games. So it'll be very interesting to see, A, if there's changes, and B, how those personnel react to being called out like that by the manager. We're safe now. Nathan's well within his rights to do that. Nathan's a man who's got to make these decisions. I'm, I'm glad he's speaking openly about it. But there are two games left to go where those players have got to react to that. Yeah, they've got to react, but they've got to, they should have reacted all season, to be fair. I mean, you've not got to be a rocket scientist or Carol Vorderman to understand that we're conceding way too many goals, and they are the problem. Um, it, you know, you put it in perspective how much how many goals Alfie May scored. He's the top goal scorer, and we're languishing middle of the bottom half of the table. So you do the maths, it's pretty straightforward that we're not good defensively. Um, he's only stating the obvious, and... Yeah, they might not like it, but listen, they're professional footballers. They've got to be professional. They get, you know, they, every week they go through the things that they do well and the things they don't do so well. And it's their job to be professional about it and try and change uh, Nathan's mind, albeit two games. Um, but th that's down to them, you know. We, you, can't, you can't polish something that you can't polish, if you know what I mean. So, and I'm, I'm with you. I'm glad that Nathan said it. It makes sense why now he said it, um, the timing of it. Um, but he's basically said what all of us, every single fan that's watched this week in, week out, have been saying all season. And that's nothing personal against the players. It's just well, that's not good enough if we want to be up in the higher echelons of this division and trying to aim and strive for higher divisions. You've got to be better. That's nothing horrible. It's just a fact of the matter. Mm, right. I said I was going to talk about this set piece table then. So um, you guys, I'm sure, will know about the Not The Top 20 podcast we've had. Um, George on George Elliott came on the show earlier on this season to talk about Michael Appleton. He's an Oxford fan. I actually met Ali over uh, the, the weekend the other day, and then he came on the show the, the next day, of course, to talk about uh, how we saw Charlton and how he wants to see the addicts progressing. It was Ali, I think, who wrote this this fantastic article with you know they do loads of stats and that sort of stuff. And this will this will come as absolutely no surprise to anyone who's who, who uh, sees my tweets about our corners. But um, he, he, they've worked out sort of like a goals for goals against. Uh, from from set pieces this season now so and then they've worked out like a goal difference so we're we're second bottom because uh, we have uh, conceded 14 goals from set pieces which sort of is lower mid table like there's a lot of, there's quite a few clubs who've conceded more quite a few clubs who've conceded less but I mean the goals for column from set pieces is one of the most pathetic things I've ever seen Tom so we've uh, to, to give you an idea, that in terms of goals scored, the team at the very top is Derby with 23, Stevenage have 18. Um, all bar two clubs are in double figures. Uh, we've scored six from set pieces this season, which is there's no other, there's no nice way of putting it. That's pathetic. Like our set pieces attacking all season have been ridiculously bad. Defensively, they haven't been great attacking wise have been ridiculously bad and that is no matter what level of football you're watching goals from set piece there would have been goals from set pieces in the champions league games over the last the last couple of nights there certainly were in, in the first leg i remember the uh, i think it was the psg barcelona game there was at least one at every level of football set pieces count and our set pieces attacking wise this season have been an absolute joke unfortunately so that's something we we clearly have to work on in the summer there's been two or three times this season where we've said something or something's happened and I've just wanted us relegated because I just feel like we deserve it. And this is one of them times. I just think if that's if you're going to be that bad, you don't deserve to be in this league, to be honest. And uh, the, the problem is, well, there's kind of two sides to it, right? I know like the amount of goals that get scored from corners is actually very low as a percentage generally. So you get a corner and everyone's like, oh my God, this is amazing. And actually, chances of you scoring it are minimal. And for us, it's even worse. But on the other side of it, the set pieces is one of the very few things that on the training ground you can control, what, 95% of them what happens? Obviously, you're going to have an opposition in the game. But in terms of where you put the ball and where you stand and where people move and, and all of that, you're in total control of that. And there's such a good opportunity to score. And so to be that bad, considering I think it was under Jacko or around that time, not that long ago, our set pieces were very, very good. To completely go from that to where we are now is is staggering. And um, 
talking of kind of relegating clubs for this, I think if if a corner can't beat the first man, then that that player should never play football again because I am about as bad at football as it's possible to be, but I can take a corner to the penalty spot. I don't know, 99 times out of 100. It's not a very difficult thing for a human being with two legs to do. And yet they, they can't do it. So, uh, yeah, you think about where we'd be. Given the amount of goals we've scored, by the way, that says a lot for, for how we've managed to score goals, really, given where we are in the league. And so that's a positive sign. But you think about how many extras we'd have if we could just put the ball in the net from a set piece. And yeah, it's something we've got to work on. But, you know, the stats have come out. I'm sure Nathan Jones is all over it. And and hopefully next season that can improve. Yeah, I don't know if you saw Bakayo Saka's corner with the last kick of the game for Arsenal at Bayern Munich. So I saw that. Very first thing I thought when I saw that is that he needs a loan to League One. I know exactly where he wants to come. Um, <laughs> Ian says, our corners have always looked hit and hope. It's like we can't be bothered to even take a corner. Well, I was, so I was reminiscing the other day when we were at Cambridge and the Charlton Media boys were trying to sort out a camera to... Um, uh, to film the post-match interviews with Nathan Jones. One of them mentioned about going to get an extension cord for power, and it reminded me of that time that Ben Garner answered the reason that we started scoring a couple of set pieces is because they'd bought a big extension cord that meant they could take a TV pitch side. Um, that meant they could sort of go through tactic set pieces whilst actually doing it. So, I mean, I'm wondering, Nave, did Ben Garner take that extension cord with him and, and we haven't got a budget to replace it? Because I've, well, I've got a spare one in the garage. Well, he might have took it to Colchester, but it didn't work for work out for him because he got sacked from there, didn't he? But um, I mean, I know you get maybe we need to do that a little bit more, but it'd be interesting. I don't know how many um, of those stats does that those six that we've scored is that including penalties? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I haven't seen it referenced either way, but I'm guessing not. Yeah. But even if you look at the defensive ones, it'll be interesting. Yeah, they're not. It's it's not yeah. Like the defensive conceded ones, is it direct? from a corner as in first phase or is it second and third? Because if you go to, if you can see what we've conceded second and third phase from a set piece, it will be even more, I guarantee it. Because it's our second and phase play sometimes, but defending set pieces and even attacking them, it's desire. I know we, sometimes we slated Ryan Innes for when he was here, but at least you can say as a set piece, you know he's going to win it. Whether mm. defensively or offensively, he has the desire to win that ball. And in my opinion, I don't think we have anyone um, in that maybe Gillespie a little bit, but someone who really d demands the box, com commands the box, heads it out. I just don't think we're strong enough defensively. And, it, it, and those stats don't surprise me at all. But as Tom said, I think I think it's saying crazy, like 15% or something of goals is set plays. And like he said, Tom said, you're in control. Even a throw-in, any, in any restart, you're in control of the ball and the... The opposition has always got to get into a shape to try and counteract what you're trying to do, but we just never look like scoring from from uh, from set players. Well, I know Alfie tucked one in top bins the other week, but from a corner, he just more or less go well because I know people got the ump go. We were going short. It was like, well, we're not scoring from corners, so we might as well go short and try and build it up a little bit. But yeah, we need to improve that next year for sure. Yeah, I mean, we've certainly seen them trying a few. Uh, different bits like um, Gillespie taking those corners up at Cambridge. And I ge genuinely thought there was a couple of them didn't look too awful in terms of delivery. But I mean, we had almost like a half chance, I think. I can't remember if it was maybe a Nike header at the far post that went back across goal that was cleared near the line. Um, but yeah, we overall, we don't. Uh, Paul says uh, Scott Fraser couldn't beat the first man, Tom, which probably uh, isn't uh, saying much. All hell let loose says Hector's not that great with his Swede. Uh, Terrell Thomas has to be our best uh, header. In terms of the defense, the defensive ones, Ian reckons we, you know, keeper who can claim uh, with confidence defensively would help that. I mean, that's that's certainly been a discussion point we've had a lot uh, this season. Um, Nath, was it you mentioned Carol Vorderman a few moments ago? Um, Paul says, didn't Vorders win multiple Rear of the Year titles? Surely that must count for something when it comes to sorting out the back line. Um, I was going to, when, when you were talking about Vorderman, I was thinking of trying to make a joke about how they take numbers from the top. And I thought, no, because then I'll say two from the top and it will sound like I'm making a joke about something else uh, about the formation she was going to play in terms of like, but I won't, I won't, I won't go down that line. Um, Saturday then, Shrewsbury, Tom, it would be nice to end the season at home well um just again just to build a little bit of that momentum i think i think the main the, the main thing for now is obviously if we can get to the end of the season unbeaten 15 games unbeaten would be a lovely little stat but we need to win our last home game of the season don't we just just to send everyone into the summer with a, with a little bit of uh, of hope and and you know we beat Shrewsbury 6-0 at the valley last season which we um we very kindly uh, didn't didn't mention to dan when he came on but i mean uh, 
if, if we could get anywhere near that sort of result, just to send us home happy, would be a nice way to end the the, the home campaign. Yeah, in the in the grand scheme of things, as you say, it, it doesn't really matter. But in terms of the day, it does. You know, it's the upbeat walk, as you say, which is a always a good day down at the valley uh, and, and an important one for the club, as we heard from Terry and Josh earlier. Um, and so you come down here with that kind of optimism just about the club. You know, there's plenty of times we've had where we hate this club for a variety of reasons, but Saturday is a day to actually be proud of the club. So then when you come down and you then see a win, it just adds to all of that. And and as you say, and we've referenced it a few times, you have plenty of false dawns with this where you end the season well and start the next season not so well, but maybe this will this will be different. And um, yeah, you certainly, no harm can come from winning and, and finishing the season strongly. If I'm right and I'm looking at the table, I think, and I don't know if uh, if we said it with Dan there, but they've scored half as many goals as us and they're two places below us. So that speaks for itself. It was absolutely ridiculous, the state of our defence and how bad we've been at that end of the pitch. But if we can score enough goals, it doesn't sound like they're going to score too many. But you know what our defence are like. We'll probably wave them through a couple of times and, and let them get a, a bit of a head start. So, yeah, I want an entertaining game. Um, I, I want to win, ultimately. And as you say, then if we can wrap up the season with a, a good, solid, unbeaten run, then Nathan Jones can go into the summer, get rid of all of the dead wood, which is pretty much the entire squad as far as I'm concerned, and, and start his rebuild. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Ian says that just means they'll score three against us anyway uh, with their lack of goals. But uh, all hell let loose is playing well in both the first half and the second half will be a good start. I mean, Nathan, again, referenced the fact that we haven't had that complete performance yet, whether that means a, a clean sheet, whether it means playing for, for 90 minutes. You could argue we, we've we struggled in both. Even the Barnsley game, which we won, weirdly, we were much better in the second half where the goals where we didn't score goals. But um, it, it would be nice to sort of lay, lay a bit of a marker about what, what we're actually going to be like for for Nathan and I guess to have, have have more of a look again at those players that we're still um and ahhing about so he would have made his mind up on, on a few of them but you know the obvious ones like um Connor Wickham who's, who scored that fantastic goal for us last week uh, up at Cambridge Nathan you know j- j- just to have a proper a cast a proper eye over these chaps for, for for the last the last couple of games will be will be really important for Nathan yeah it will I think obviously you've got a load of people out of contract People like TC, Tyrese Campbell's out of contract, isn't he? I think, um, although the last couple of weeks he's shown a little bit of grit and a little bit more enthusiasm when he's come on. So maybe he's trying to win one there. You've got likes of, obviously, Michael Hector and Terrell Thomas and stuff like that, which goes back onto our last point about the defence. But this it's an opportunity for, for Nathan to look at the players and like, as you say, it'll be interesting if he changes it, but judging by what he said in his pre-match, I don't think he's going to change much unless you have to. Um, but I'd like to see, you know, I've banged on about Pan all season. I just like the, like the guy anyway, but I don't think he's going to get a game now. <laughs> but um, also tomorrow is probably going to be Dobbo's last game. I, maybe it won't be. I don't know what happens anymore. But if it is his last game, hopefully he can get a, a good reception. He get, comes off at the end of the five minutes to go or something stupid like that. Um, but didn't we wallop these before, like six nil or something? Yeah, six nil at the end of last season. So, like yeah. I say, a repeat of that would be good. One. Yeah, but as you say, um, so uh, quite a few people referencing George Dobson. Um, probably going to be his last home game. Then, I mean, I- unless anything changes, Bob's saying is is there any news on the the Dobbo move? Well, as as we've reiterated, I mean, he is currently pre contracted to another club, so to get out of that contract either someone has to buy him out of it or someone has to pay the club money so that's how it works and whether we do that or not i don't know i'd, I'd love for george to stay but i mean if it is his last game uh ian said he'd like to see like say a possible hat trick for him on his last game but um andrew says dobbo to get a good reception maybe come off in the 85th i mean if that is to be his last game i think I, I, hopefully it will be a, a very very good reception for whenever is his last few moments on, on the valley pitch because throughout all the, the crap we've put up with over the last the last few years he's been he, he's been sort of a mainstay and actually a, a player that you could be proud to watch and you know you you, you could see him pull on the shirt with pride and, and he put 110 percent into every performance that, that he did for us even when it wasn't going his way even when he had a few a few games that, that weren't his very best he, he's always put in as much effort as, as physically possible for him and he's, and he's given us some some moments to be proud of you know the Ipswich the, the goal at Ipswich um, the away goal at Rotherham, but obviously not not just known for his for his goal scoring, not really known for his goal scoring, if we're being honest, Tom. But 
he he sort of epitomised everything you wanted to see from a, a Charlton captain wearing wearing the shirt. And if this is to be the last time that we see him at the Valley, then let's hope he gets an, an amazing reception. Yeah, it's just uh, it's just crap all round, isn't it? Really, it's um, it's not the way any of us want it to end. If that's the way it does, I think he deserves to be to have some success with us. Uh, I'm sure it'll all come out as and when he does go and we'll find out exactly what has happened because I know there's lots of rumours and personally I don't know enough about who's made the decision and all of that sort of stuff but if the rumours are to be believed around what we were offering him compared to what others are being paid and who has made this decision then it absolutely stinks and it, and as I say it's just crap and those people, that person, whatever, have a have a lot to answer for. Uh, you know, he's not the best player in the world. I'm not suggesting that for a second. And it will be very interesting to see how we cope without him next year and whether he does leave a massive hole or if actually we can plug it some other way by having better players in positions around him. But for me, pound for pound, he's one of our best players this season. He won't win player of the year, I don't think, probably because of Alfie May's goals. But you could argue, as you say, he's been the most consistent. And I go back to something I've said regularly on this pod ever since I've been on it. When you're a fan, you just want someone who looks like they care, even if they're not a Charlton fan. And realistically, when they make a move, they give the same for another club. Whilst they're putting that Charlton shirt on, all you want is for them to give their all. And I think this season, there are plenty of people we've called out for not doing that. But he has done it every single year, despite being surrounded by some absolute dross in that side and being treated very badly potentially by ownership. So, yeah, I hope we can find a way to do it. I don't think we will, and I don't think people will will kind of admit their mistakes and hold their hands up, and I think we're going to lose a real key asset, and that's a real shame. But if that is the case, then, yeah, absolutely. He deserves to be brought off a few minutes before the end and, and to get the ovation he deserves. It's just a shame he won't get the the promotion opportunity or the chance to get his hands on a trophy or anything like that, um, because I think he deserves that with us as well. But out of our control in it yeah and we'll see uh we'll, we'll see how that works out ian says bang on uh tom paul says uh coventry had his best game when dobbo uh was not playing against derby uh spam says uh, at the end of the day he wants to leave he could have waited to see if a new manager would help him uh give him a better contract but we yeah, like i said we don't know the ins and outs of it at the time you know, don't forget the club were willing to sell him in, in in february when when the hungarian window closed he was you know a reporter i remember coming home from reading and i reported that he was Set to be on the plane on, on on the Sunday or the Monday to go and sign that deal, and and it got pulled out the the last minute by by the club. Um, so you know there, there were two took two to tango in that situation. The club were willing to to sell him at that point in, in, until it fell through uh, at the last minute. Right, we've run out of time. Um, yeah, Bob says maybe we'll get sorted before the the, the end of the year dinner well, well we'll be at the player of the year dinner if we get a chance to speak to george obviously we'll we'll invite him to our to our little table in the corner and see if he's up for an interview um but you never know when when players are in slightly sticky situations like that whether he'd be up for speaking but hope, hopefully it will be because even if it is just to talk through his time uh at the club right we've run out of time uh, on this week's uh, big match preview absolutely uh flown by oh gary's email saying that we need to fix half the floodlights in the ground it needs some tlc well hopefully they'll get that sorted by next season um yeah uh, i've really enjoyed uh, this evening's show massive thanks to everyone who's uh, joined us live uh, in the youtube comments don't forget to subscribe um to our to our youtube channel so you never miss another live show the next one will be on sunday morning of course subscribe on your podcast app as well so our pod always downloads automatically to your listening uh, device massive thanks uh, to terry uh, from the charlton community trust and to josh greenwood from the upbeats who joined us in the earlier part of the show don't forget to donate as i said in the link in the bottom of our youtube page uh, to our upbeats uh, walk page for saturday a uh, huge thanks as always to tom and to nathan absolute pleasure to speak to the pair of you cheers lads Cheers, boys. I'll see your beautiful face Saturday morning, Louis. Nice and certainly early. Certainly will. Friday, I'll make you breakfast in bed if that's what you're sort of hinting at. Um, we'll, uh, yeah, so we'll be back on Sunday uh, with very tired legs after walking all the way to the uh, to the ground. Uh, but for now, I'll just say I'm Louis Meadows. Thanks for listening. This has been Charlton Live, sponsored by the British Institute of Kitchen, Bedroom and Bathroom Installation. Might see some of you at the, ch- at the uh, Upbeats Walk uh, on uh, Saturday. If not, we'll see you guys here on Sunday morning. <laughs>